Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for a review of the new Knife LP, Shaking the Habitual. The Knife is an electronic music duo hailing from Sweden, consisting of brother, sister, Karen, and Olaf Dreer. And for years, these guys have been creating synth pop, electro pop, art pop through their handful of releases with some really great singles like Pass This On, Silent Shout, and their sort of sleeper hit Heartbeats, which was a huge track for them, surprisingly just blowing up in the middle of the 2000s. But the thing is, by the time everybody was getting hyped on this track, getting introduced to the knife, people from all around the world paying and paying and paying attention to their music, getting open to this new sound that they're purveying, the knife was already kind of setting sail for much darker and more or shadowy territory when they ended up dropping the album Silent Shout in 2006. By the time Silent Shout came out, The Knife already had a pretty bold, eccentric style to their brand of synth pop. Karen and Olaf were just diehards for synthetic sounds, drum machines, and Karen's voice and her lyrics, her one of a kind, just strange, out there voice was just so freaking attention grabbing, but kind of moving as, as well in a strange way. And Silent Shout took much of these characteristics and brought the knife into just more shadowy territory with some elements of ambient music and techno popping up here and there and sort of blending in with their synth pop and art pop and electro pop style. Deep Cuts did have its zany moments like hanging out at the end of the LP, that was the only thing that I think Silent Shout really kind of cut out of the equation and it swapped out these weird unpredictable eccentricities for just a record that was way more concise. Now, after Silent Shout came out, it would be a while, till this record, till fans would hear anything else from The Knife in kind of a normal capacity. And this was actually around the time that The Needle Drop started. And a lot of what The Knife was doing around this time would actually lead to some pretty important reviews for this channel. Like when Karen Dreer Anderson came out with her solo debut with the album Fever Ray, which ended up being my album of the year in 2009, an amazing record that I am still a diehard fan for. And then of course, after that, The Knife put out Tomorrow in a Year, a collaboration with Planning to Rock and Mount Sims, which was sort of this avant experimental opera, a commissioned ode to Darwinism that I like to pretend doesn't exist. Because it led to one of my most infamously negative reviews on this channel ever of all time. But honestly, I don't really think I can ignore the existence of Tomorrow in a Year anymore because that album seems so pivotal to the development of what is going on here with Shaking the Habitual. Because of Tomorrow in a Year, the experimental floodgates are open on Shaking the Habitual. They're open all the way. And also like Tomorrow in a Year, Shaking has a pretty huge sense of purpose to it as well. It's incredibly ambitious at 98 minutes, features a variety of different tracks and different flavors, ambient tracks, soundscapes, interludes, freaky, deaky, whacked out dance pop tracks that go on for very long periods of time and have pretty linear hypnotic progressions. And whacked out is a phrase that I would like to reiterate because if Deep Cuts was essentially like The Knife's pop album, Silent Shout was their sort of nocturnal LP, then Shaking the Habitual is the album where they really go completely insane. That's not to say this album doesn't have composure though, because this LP does seem to have a lot of detail to it. There's a lot of care put into the details on this album. Every move is more challenging than the next on this thing. And I would also say that it is beautifully strange. It's kind of like being the first person to lay eyes upon this undiscovered species of jungle bird whose tail feathers are so bright and plentiful that they cause this emotional, just visual sensory overload that hits you with all this ah, 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 ah. Because this LP really is a rush of different ideas and feelings and sounds. And even though the knife does play with a lot of pop characteristics, a lot of pop motifs on this LP, there are some catchy melodies. There are choruses on a lot of these tracks. Because these things are here, people are going to hear this album, and because people have heard their previous stuff, they're going to expect some immediacy 
on this LP. They're going to expect just some directness. However, I would say that this album is really anything but direct or immediate. I would actually say that in a lot of ways this album is kind of difficult to digest to the point where on an initial cursory listen, what is on Shaking the Habitual may seem like nothing more than incoherent babble. But if you sort of look at the details of what's going on, on the greater arc of this LP, it becomes apparent that this double album, the two sides of this album essentially, mirror each other in some really interesting ways. Both sides of this album feature a weird experimental interlude that is under a minute. Both feature an incredibly experimental track like A Cherry on Top, which is this weird, noisy, intense soundscape. And the other half of the LP, Fracking Fluid Injection, is the track that comes off as being incredibly out there, experiment-wise, which sort of seems to be this weird venture into the world of metallic string notes and vocals, <laughs> laid with this delay that makes these sounds just sort of bounce on and on and on to oblivion. Both tracks are sort of puzzling, colorful, and add a lot of character to each side of the album. Both sides of this LP also feature fast, unsettlingly freakish electronic dance numbers like Full of Fire as well as Stay Out Here. Both sides of this LP also feature slower jams and other tracks too that fit into this spectrum of being pretty catchy or just sort of straightforward and complex. The only odd man out is the 20 minute long ambient soundscape which ends the first half of the LP, which if anything is just sort of an effective intermission in between the two albums, one just sort of separating the other. You've just got this huge gap of downtime before you hear the knife essentially put together the same album once more, but in kind of a different fashion. Now, given that the knife historically has been kind of a synth pop band, electro pop band, maybe a long ambient interlude isn't the best of tracks to sort of throw at knife fans. But by ambient music standards, I will say that this track is, I mean, pretty impressive. The sounds that they come up with are vivid, they're vast, I love how formless the track is, I love how it goes through multiple phases. This track is not enjoyable in the same way that other tracks on this album are enjoyable. I understand if a lot of people don't necessarily get the same excitement out of this track that they do out of a song like Full of Fire, but I do think this song on this LP serves a unique purpose. Not only that, but I feel like Characteristically, sonically, musically, this song fits in with a lot of other tracks here because it does share a kind of primal, primeval, and very simple and rudimentary characteristic. The track A Tooth for an Eye feels kind of primal in a way as well, especially because of its beat, which feels hugely influenced by African and just Afro beat music in general. The woodwind melody on this track and the metallic polyrhythms dancing all over this rhythm as well also totally gives off that vibe, but the knife totally knifes it up with these shiny, shiny arpeggios just glistening atop this rhythm, as well as the heavy resonant synth bass line and Karen Dreer Anderson's incredibly eccentric and sharp vocal. Another drum heavy primal track comes through with the song Without You My Life Would Be Boring. I love how booming the drums are on this track and just how cacophonous they are. The percussion and the woodwind, the way it all comes together, it feels like just I'm listening to a drum circle, I'm listening to communal music, I'm listening to people just sort of come together and create a ruckus just to make it and I am as the listener and just locked in the middle of it. It's electric, it's energetic, it's inspiring. It feels rootsy, it has no inhibitions pulling it back. And yet the hook on this track is so sharp. I love Karen's vocal performance as well, which seems incredibly composed. I love the freakish group vocals on this track. The song Wrap Your Arms Around Me also has a booming bass drum on it and has these metallic swells of synthesizers. It's a slow moving ballad. It's chilling. And the way that the melody comes off on this track, it also kind of reminds me of like Portis head? But much, much eerier in only the way the knife can do an eerie, eerie heart piercing track. I actually think this song is one of the most beautiful tracks I've 
heard this year, hands down. The more electronically flavored tracks on here, like the incredibly weird Full of Fire, the track Networking, which has a ton of busy 808 sequenced rhythms on it, or the song Redis, which has just some very strange duet vocals on it, which totally freak me the hell out. Not only are they just kind of weaving in and out of pitch or sensibility, but as they're doing it, they just feel so passionate and they feel so otherworldly and just, man, they just pull up all these emotions in me that I just cannot make sense of. The beat's pretty intense on that track too, and even though these songs are a little more synthetic than some of the other sort of drum bass tracks, though I'm sure are looped, you are hearing a lot of natural acoustic drum timbres on there. I guess what I'm getting at is that these more synthetic tracks, they feel no less a part of the album than tracks like A Tooth for an Eye, because they too have strange vocals, catchy choruses, long, hypnotic, linear song structures, repetition, experimentation, and of course, they're bold as hell. So again, to reiterate, overall, this album, though, it can be difficult to digest and separate and organize in your head. It is not chaos. It is not unplanned, just sort of meandering and blah, blah, blah sort of just throwing all these ideas at the canvas and just hoping that something sticks, which can kind of be the case when you're talking about an album this long. So there is flow, there is an arc, there is consistency to this thing. Now, not only is the way that the album is built structurally interesting, but the performances are really good too. I mean, the songwriting is definitely there, the vocals are passionate, they're moving, and when they're not that, they're just kind of eye-widening and awe inspiringly weird. The synths on this LP are rich, they're sharp, they're heavy. Some of the added instrumentation, especially the woodwinds, are, are, are very real, they're organic, they're raw. The beats and grooves on this thing change and progress enough for the songs to remain interesting as they go into these longer lengths. The mix on these tracks is stellar. There's tons of variety among these songs. I'm actually pretty freaking enthralled and impressed with much of everything that this album had to offer. Uh, maybe there are some spots like the more experimental Experimental tracks on this LP and of course the big intermission that separates these two tracks that I feel it could have been on the whole a little bit more interesting but man when this album is awesome it is awesome I'm feeling a light to decent nine on this album if you've given it a listen what did you think of it did you love it did you hate it why what do you think I should review next and uh, yeah that's it the knife Shaking the habitual forever. <laughs>